Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath, everybody. We have Barbara and Elisa for our Sabbath school today. And our lesson is Deuteronomy in the later writings. But before we do anything, we need the Holy Spirit here. So, Elisa, if you could open us in prayer. Sure. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us here together again to study your word. It's always a privilege to do that. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us. Let your words and thoughts be spoken here and touch each heart that is listening, Lord. Each one is here for a different reason, different purpose to hear your word, and we pray that, that your will be, will be done in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we're going to start off with the memory verse, Deuteronomy 10, 15. <clears throat> Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples, as it is this day. And actually, I'm even going to go one further, and it's still right now, since we are spiritual Israel. Did you know that there are 57 quotes that are either direct or allusions to Deuteronomy in the New Testament? Yes, I got it from the internet, but, and I'm guessing there are hundreds more of references in the Old Testament from Joshua on. So how did one book make such an impression on the scripture that came after it? We look at Deuteronomy as the fifth book and the Pentateuch, Literally a summation of the previous four books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And in Deuteronomy, we see something used throughout the Bible, the concept of repetition and expansion. We read the first four commandments in Exodus 20 and, in, and Deuteronomy 5. You shall have no other gods before you. You shall make or not make any idols to worship. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain, and you are to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Deuteronomy 6, 5 comes along and says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. It includes those four commandments and so much more. It literally sums them up, and it was such a popular verse and so well I think we can see this in Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, and this is Jesus speaking, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole <laughs> law and the prophets. Makes it pretty simple, huh? Mm -hmm. The first one is Deuteronomy 6.5, as we said. And the second is from Leviticus 19.18. But we can see echoes of it in Deuteronomy in 15.11. For the poor will never cease to be in the land. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall freely open your hand to your brother or your needy and poor in your land. And we can kind of see the, the essence of that at least echo through that. Just as Deuteronomy had been a powerful reference for scripture that came after it, as we'll see in today's lesson, there are also lessons relevant to us today. Let's first, or let's first take a look at Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 19. When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me, I love it because this is Moses writing this. Nothing surprises God. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your countrymen who or you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. Moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. <clears throat> since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. You shall not multiply wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away. Nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. Now, 
It shall come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law, that would be the book of Deuteronomy, on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest. It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes. Oh, boy, what counsel. If only, the only king to really follow that, at least that I know of in the Bible, to closely follow that, especially verses 18 and 19, was King Josiah, which we'll cover in Sunday's lesson. Can you imagine if Solomon would have followed that? With all of his wives, with his horse stables and his chariots, with the gold and silver that he accumulated for himself? Literally, the Bible would have been changed. The Israel would have never split to the ten northern tribes, and Judah and Benjamin in the south, etc. But so many times we see this that where God tells us something, and yet we have something else in mind. Now, that was back then, but what about today? It shall be with him that he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. Do we need that? By carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes. Does God have anything bad for us in mind? Or is this really the best that we're going to get, but we just don't realize it most of the time? So my question is, in the, today's lesson... What nuggets of truth can we get from God's word, from Deuteronomy, or the other Bible verses that have repeated Deuteronomy? First, we're going to look at the Reformation of Josiah and what the lesson, our lesson has to teach us about God's faithful leader. Then we're going to see what a creator of, of all of us expects from us, how we recognize his deep truths, and realize what we need to change. We'll realize that even when we have the truth, how that doesn't guarantee salvation. We just can't act the role or, or go through the motions. From the prophet Micah and others, we'll see what true religion and worship are, what God requires of us, so that we will truly know him. And finally, we'll see from Daniel's prayer the harm that our sin can cause. The direction it takes our lives, it helps us also to remember that what is in the past is done and reminds us what matters most in our decisions for the future to serve God and to act out the true religion spoken of in Micah. Every one of these points for, the, for those in the past or every one of these lessons points to those in the past, but it points to us today as well. God's requirements have never changed. He still desires to remold us into his image, now and forevermore. And just a few more quotes from Deuteronomy, quickly. When did Jesus use Deuteronomy? We've already had the one quote, but early on in Matthew 4, verses 4, 7, and 10, when the devil is tempting him. We have Deuteronomy 8.3 being used in Matthew 4.4, 4, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In Matthew 4.7, it's referencing Deuteronomy 6.16. And Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And Matthew 4.10 is referencing Deuteronomy 6.13 and Deuteronomy 10.20. Then Jesus said to, them, to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In other versions, it could be translated, And fulfill religious duty to him only. <clears throat> so on that note, now we see the depths of Deuteronomy in Scripture. Barbara, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson, the book of the law? The book of the law. Uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about on Sunday's lesson has to do with who we call Good King Josiah. Now, Josiah was only eight years old when he became king, which is very young, <clears throat> yet he reigned 31 years before his death on the battlefield. 
in the, but in the 18th year of his reign, something happened, at least for a while, that changed the history of God's people. So we're going to get into what that is today, um, a little bit later, later in the lesson. Ellen White says Josiah, from his earliest manhood, had endeavored to take advantage of his position as king to exalt the principles of God's holy law. And now, while Shaphan, the scribe, was reading to him out of the book of the law, the king discerned in this volume a treasure of knowledge and a powerful ally in the work of reform he so much desired to rot in the land. He resolved to walk in the light of its counsel and also to do all in his power to acquaint his people with its teachings and lead them to heaven. To cultivate reverence and love for the law of heaven. But the reformation of Josiah and the radical return to his law, first of, first of all, to be attributed to the personal character of Josiah and to the profound and to his profound piety. Never in the history teachers' comments of Israel was a king so close to the ideal to the Torah. So he was really the one who had tried to get the people of Israel to stay close to, to God and, and, the, and those of the kings. The idols that had been accumulated by his predecessors had been utterly destroyed. So God blessed Josiah's reign from 639 to 608 BC, which lasted more than 30 years and was much longer than the reign of his predecessors. In the twelfth year of his reign, he makes his first formal decision, and it involves the restoration of the temple in Jerusalem, a concern that is clearly at the heart of the book of Deuteronomy. Joshua's first work of restoration concerns, therefore, the whole religious economy. The temple in Jerusalem is repaired and purified. All the Canaanite and Assyrian idols are removed. The whole country is involved through offerings in this reconstruction. But it's the 18th year again in which the next step of the Reformation is engaged. So we want to dig into how this incident came about and what we can learn from it. So let's read 2 Kings 22, and we will begin in verse 8. Then Hilkiah the priest said to Sephon the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Helkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. Josiah was deeply stirred, and he heard, and he, as he heard read for the first time the exhortations and warnings recorded in this ancient manuscript. Never before had he realized so full the plainness with which God had set before Israel life, death, blessings, and cursings. The book abounded in assurances of God's willingness to save the, to the uttermost those who should place their trust fully in him. As he had wrought in their deliverance from bo Egyptian bondage, he would work mightily in establishing the land of promise and placing them at the head of the nations of the earth. And we see that in Prophets and Kings from Ellen White. So although through the next chapter we can see how seriously King Josiah sought to keep his commandments and testimonies. So we're going to look at, at kind of the steps here that Josiah used to make a turnaround for God's people. Um, in 2 Kings 23.3 we see, Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart, his soul, his mind, to perform the covenant that was written in the book and for his people to take a stand for the covenant. So, then, so that was what he did first. So first of all is he committed to the covenant, then he led his people to the law. In Deuteronomy 4.29, but from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and soul. These principles apply to us today, don't they? 
You shall, Deuteronomy 6, 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And Deuteronomy 10, 12, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? And Deuteronomy 11:13, and it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you, to love your Lord and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So we see this through all of these uh, texts in Deuteronomy. We see this theme of loving God with all your heart and soul and mind and obeying his commandments. So that was the first step Josiah took. Then, uh, next, he looks at purging um, all of the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem. And so let's take a look at those scriptures. And we'll see that in 2 Kings 34, 4 through 6. And the king haman commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, the priests of the second order and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles of Baal and Asherah and of the hosts of heaven and burned them outside of Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes to Bethel. That's a pretty heavy duty. First he, he burned them all and then he actually t took the ashes and disposed of the ashes. Then he removed the idolatrous priests from the kings of, that the kings of Judah had ordained to burn the incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places around Jerusalem. And those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations of heaven. And he brought out wooden images from the house of the Lord to the brook of Kidron outside of Jerusalem. And he burned that at the brook of Kidron and ground the ashes and threw the ashes into the graves of the common people. This is pretty symbolic here, what he's doing, of literally burning and getting rid of all the sin that they had in the camp. Then in 2 Kings 23, 24, we see, moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted medium spirits to the household gods and idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land and in Judah, that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hakiah the priest, had found in the house of the Lord. But he didn't stop there. So, first of all, he, he brought the people to God. Then he took and burnt everything and, and got rid of it. All, he, he got it out of their hearts and out of their minds. But then, thirdly, he does something that goes above and beyond, and this is what that is. In 2 Kings 23:20, 20, he executed all the priests of the high places who were there on all the altars and burned men's bones on them, and, return, and he returned to Jerusalem. So we see how far God's people had wandered from the truth. But these steps that he used in his life are also steps we can use for sin in our lives. Turn to God. Get rid of all those things in our lives, burn them, get rid of them that are keeping us from God. And then remove those people from our lives who are not good examples. Mm. So what a dangerous deception that we can fall into when we don't follow, um, when we don't love God with all our hearts. Okay. And follow him with all of our heart. Yep. Those little mm -hmm. exceptions. Elisa, can you tell us about the Heaven of Heavens, Monday's lesson? Sure, thank you, Byron. Heaven of Heavens. So in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses wrote down the obligations of Israel's relationship with God. Clearly stated in the Law and the Covenant, these obligations were central to Israel's purpose as a nation and their relationship with God, with each other, and with the people of other nations or strangers. For example, in Deuteronomy 7, 6, and 14, 2, we read, You are a holy people to the Lord your God, chosen by God for himself, a special treasure above all other people. In Deuteronomy 18, 5, 
we read that the Levites were set apart to minister in the name of the Lord. So by establishing his covenant, his law and statutes, and the sanctuary service, along with the Levitical priesthood, Christ put into practice a system intended to help the Israelites remember and preserve knowledge of him perpetually throughout their generations. Also preserved in the book of Deuteronomy is a declaration of who God is and what authority he has to re require these covenant obligations as a supreme sovereign over heaven and earth. In Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 15, we read, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all people, as it is this day. So what does heaven of heavens mean? or the heaven and the highest heavens. While Moses does not specifically say what he means, the context of the verses compares God's greatness, power, and sovereignty over all creation in heaven where he dwells, on earth, and all that is under the earth. Given that God is the only self-existent one, he is a creator of all things and retains a right and authority over all things. In contrast, the Israelites were the least of all people. We read about that in Deuteronomy 7.7 7 in a previous lesson. Moses was articulating the remarkable contrast between God and man and how pathetic it really is that God has to appeal to us for our obedience. He is a God who holds our breath in his hand and owns all our way. We read that in Daniel 5.23. Yet God makes this appeal to us for our obedience because he is love and will not and cannot force our obedience. He has created us with the gift of free choice to choose whom we will serve. The message of Daniel 10 is as much for us today as it was for the Israelites whom Moses was addressing. The Hebrew word used in heaven of heavens in Deuteronomy 10 is shamayim. This is the same word that is used in Genesis 1 when it talks about creating heaven and earth or the firmament of the earth, the heavens where the sun, moon, and stars are in. In the Bible, in the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, the word Shemayim is used for heaven as the place where God dwells. For example, in Genesis 24, Abraham refers to God as the Lord, the God of heaven. And in Genesis 28:12, we read of Jacob's ladder set up on earth and the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. In the New Testament, which is in the Greek text, the Greek word for heaven was uh, Uranus. It's used in a similar fashion. For example, in Luke 3.21, when Jesus was baptized, the text stated that heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended. In this case, heaven was where the Holy Ghost descended from, or God's dwelling place. In Luke 4, we read that in the days of Elijah, Heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a great famine in the land. This heaven is referring to Earth's atmosphere where the clouds and rain are formed. So out throughout the Bible, we see the reference to three heavens. The first heaven being the Earth's atmosphere. The second heaven where the sun, moon, stars, and planets are, or what we think of as being outer space. And the third heaven as the dwelling place of God. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul refers to the third heaven when he saw in vision um, paradise. 
and where he heard inexpressible words that were unlawful for man to utter. Thus Paul is referencing God's dwelling place as the third heaven. So we can logically conclude that when the Bible writers wrote of the heaven of heavens, or the highest heaven, they were likely referring to the heaven over all heavens, or the dwelling place of God and his creatorship and sovereign authority over all creation. Let's read just a few more texts that discuss heaven of heavens. In 1 Kings 8.27, it says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built. So that was Solomon uh, speaking when he had built the temple uh, to God. And then in Nehemiah 9, 6, we read, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all the things that are therein, the seas and all that are therein, and thou preservest them, and the host of heaven worship you. In Psalms 148.4, we read, Praise him, ye heaven of heavens, and ye water that be above the heavens. So let's uh, maybe talk about Jeremiah and, and his discussion around Deuteronomy. Oh, thank you, Elisa, yeah. for that. And Deuteronomy and Jeremiah, Tuesday's lesson. We all have choices now, don't we? We can choose to follow God or we can choose something else. And we see in Deuteronomy, in the lesson, it opens up um, with Deuteronomy and Jeremiah about the choices that we have. Deuteronomy 4, 23 and 24 says, So watch yourselves that you do not forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. And made for yourselves a graven, or and make for yourselves a graven image in the form of anything against which the Lord your God has commanded you, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And we've seen this many times before in Scripture, to where the children of Israel have fallen short of the mark per se. We'll just put it that way with the golden calf, with mm -hmm. the grumbling in the wilderness, among many, many other things, let alone the kings. But, and they have served many other gods, and we're going to follow up with um, verse 29. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. The lesson talks about how in Jeremiah 29:13. It says the same thing in verse 29. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 29, 13 says the same thing as Deuteronomy 4, 29. That searching for him with all your heart and with all your soul, that sounds like real work though, doesn't it? If you put God first, that means everything else comes second. But it all starts with that choice. Whether you choose life in Christ or death and the world. And we've had a Sabbath school lesson on this before. Let's, let's read what Jeremiah has to say about, about in chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, about the message at the temple gate. And the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate, or yeah, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there the word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah, who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words, saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And we'll come back to that emphasis three times, but for if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then I will let you dwell in this place and in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, 
you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. I love that last verse. So what are they doing, or so what are they doing that Jeremiah would give such a warning? These are God's people, right? These are God's people yeah. going to temple. They're holy, and God is there. And God is telling them to change their ways. Well, how are they supposed to be? I guess really is the question. What are they doing wrong? These are the people that represent God. These are supposed to be the light to the world, right? And you shall, in Exodus 19, 6 says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. They are ambassadors to God, right? But as we continue in Jeremiah 7, we're going to read verses 9 through 14. It says, Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and offer sacrifices to Baal, and walk after other gods that you have not known? Then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered, that you may do all these abominations. Oh, has this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, declares the Lord. But go now to my place which was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at the first, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these things, declares the Lord, and I spoke to you, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear, and called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house which is called by my name, and which you trust, and to the place which I gave you and your fathers, as I did to Shiloh. If you remember Shiloh, do you remember the priest Eli? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And his rotten sons? Yep. And how they died in battle and how Eli fell and broke his neck and how when the Philistines took the ark away, Shiloh was destroyed. Mm -hmm. It's Wiped devastating. Down. So we can go back though and look at verses 6 and 9. And they've broken at least six of the Ten Commandments. Stealing, murder, adultery, lying, sacrifice to Baal. There's got to be some idols in there somewhere. And walking after other gods. And yet they go to the temple service and worship as if nothing is wrong. And it's, as stated in verse 4, and that repeated three times is for the emphasis, but they so strongly believe that if they just go through the motions and do what they're supposed to do, that they'll be saved. Did anyone else think that way during Jesus' time? Perhaps the Pharisees? Yeah. Yep. God is in the temple, and so they think, oh, the God's there. We're saved. We're, we're in the presence of the Lord. But in verse 8, it tells them that these are deceptive words, and God tells them not to believe that lie. What Israel forgot is that the covenant is conditional. Even back to Abraham, if we read Genesis 18, verses 18 and 19, since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he had spoken about him. So wait a minute. God is saying that if they do not follow his ways, and righteousness and justice, God can't turn Abraham into a great nation. It is always conditional, these covenantal promises. It was true back then, it's true today. As we sit here now, if we don't keep the covenant that we have with the Lord, we don't have, if we don't follow in his ways, we don't have a covenant. If we don't have a covenant, we don't have eternal life. But I keep the Sabbath, you say. I pay my tithes and offerings. I serve at church. 
and I worship and pray twice a day. I'll even go as far, I do Sabbath school. <laughs> Unless we keep the way of the Lord by doing what's right in his eyes, and it comes from your heart, and God is truly the one that motivates you by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you do not have a covenant with God. Only the Holy Spirit can motivate us to do his good pleasure and will. Everything else is selfishness. Unless God is dwelling in our heart, we will be like ancient Israel and have no covenant relationship with him. No eternal life, but the only thing we will have is the life of discord or discord contrary to the will of God. Now, I don't want that. God doesn't want that. But who does want that? Satan. Satan does. And God tells us in Isaiah 1, 18 through 20, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So we have a choice. And we know what we're supposed to do. It's not that hard. I pray that we all choose God to obey him. Him who wants the best for us with love and joy from our hearts. Barbara, can you tell us about what the Lord does require? I will. We're going to spend a lot of time today looking at Micah and uh, Moses and some, actually some of the other minor prophets as well. So um, as we look at the writings of the prophets, so much of their writings consist of appealing to the faithfulness of God's people. And we see that through every time and through every age. This is what the book of Deuteronomy depicted, the, re the reaffirmation of God's covenant with Israel. The Lord was now, after a 40-year detour, about to fulfill more of his promises by giving the children and the promised, the promised land and developing them into a nation. Thus Moses admonished the people to fulfill their end of the covenant as well. Indeed, much of the writings of the prophets was basically the same, again, appealing to God's people. So as we look at Micah and Moses, they dealt with the same issues plaguing Israel. Little is known about the personal life of the prophet Micah. He came from a town called Morishet. He lived during the, the, during the reign of King Rehoboam of Judah and the succeeding kings about 150 years before the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonian hosts. So this was the time period of Micah. In this time, as often before him, the people of both Judah and the northern kingdom had abandoned their ways. Um, and so um, as he, we look at Jerusalem and Samaria, the two capitals of the Jewish kingdoms, were the center, center of idol worship and bad living. The rich were oppressed and the laws of the Torah were rejected. So let's see what Micah has to say to the people. Hear now that the Lord, what the Lord says, Arise, please your case before the mountains and the hills. Hear your voice. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's complaint and your strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a complaint against his people. And we're going to remember that, this complaint against his people, because we're going to talk about that a little bit further in the lesson. And he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, I have, what have I done to you? And how have I, have I wearied you? Testify against me. For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. I sent you before Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, the son of Bor, answered him from Acacia Grove in Gilgal to what that you may know the righteousness of the Lord 
What that shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with a calf of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with the thousand rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? This kind of sounds like they're trying to buy God, doesn't it? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O God, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before God. So the religion of Micah, like Moses, begins his speech with the same appealing question. What does the Lord require of you? And that's a question for us today, too. What does the Lord require from us? This question represents one of the most crucial concerns about religion. How can humans approach God and respond to his expectations? The traditional answer would be sacrifices, precious offerings, and good works for God. Micah's answer, just as Moses, is not to offer so much external gifts, but to do justice, to love kindness toward humans in need. Micah echoes in Deuteronomy in his words the phrase, do justice and the key word love are common in both texts. We see this in Deuteronomy 16:20. You shall follow what is altogether just, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God has given you. Micah is not saying that sacrifice and offerings are wrong, but all righteous acts without proper relationship with God and one's neighbor are worthless. So let's look at a couple of other prophets. But let justice run down like water, and righteousness like a mighty stream. Hosea 6.6, 6, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, um, and a knowledge of God more than burnt offering. So Bible have so seen, in, back in the verses of Micah, what is known as a covenant lawsuit. And we talked about, I, I remember I said, remember this in which the Lord sues or brings a case against the people for a violation of the covenant. In this case, Micah says that the Lord has a complaint against you, and we saw that in Michael 2. It says, for the Lord has a complaint against his people. This complaint is literally a legal dispute. That is, the Lord was bringing a legal case against them. Imagery that implies the legal, besides the rational aspect of the covenant, this should be, shouldn't be surprising because, after all, central to the covenant was the law. So if we look in Deuteronomy, we see a comparison. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, your soul, and keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you. Instead, though, of quoting it directly, Micah modifies it by exchanging the letter of the law in Deuteronomy to the spirit of the law. And we see that a lot more in the New Testament where Christ talks about the spirit of the law, which is about being just and merciful. What seems to happen here is that whatever the outward appearance of religion and piety those sacrifices of rams and goats and, and calves, that's not what the dispute constitutes of Israel's covenant relationship. What good is all this outward piety if they covet the fields and burn them by violence and seize their houses so they oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance? So all these gifts, all of these acts of um, contrition cannot win God's favor. He requires from us a mercies, a contrite spirit, an open heart, the light of truth, loving compassion for our fellow men, and a spirit refusing to be bribed through avarice and self-love. The priests and rulers were destitute for these essentials to God's favor and their most precious gifts and gorgeous ceremonies were an admonition in his eyes. And that comes from 
Signs of the Time, March 21. My, Micah also condemns those who oppose or oppressive to one another. So not only are we to live a just life, but he also is condemning those who, who oppress someone else. They covet fields, take them by violence, also houses the houses and seize them. So they oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Israel was supposed to be the light of the world. They were supposed to be what other nations would look at with wonder. So surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Hence, they would act with wisdom and with understanding, which included treating people with justice and with mercy. So God does not look for us. He would much rather have us live just lives than, than to sacrifice. Amen. Yeah, we are that whole, they're supposed to be that holy nation, that royal priesthood. Give me your property. <laughs> I'm going to steal your house from you. Exactly. <laughs> Elisa, can you tell us about Daniel's prayer on Thursday? Yes. Um, Daniel is one of my favorite books of the Bible. So um, I, I love just the fact that they added it into this lesson and and certainly we can we can learn a lot from this prayer so after the fall of babylon in the first year of king darius daniel understood from the reading of the writings of jeremiah that the time of israel's captivity in babylon and the desolation of jerusalem was about up he earnestly sought the lord through fasting and prayer to make confession understand the times, and ask the Lord to move on behalf of his people. In Daniel's prayer, we find reference back to the book of Deuteronomy. Let's explore the prayer and uncover the connections to Deuteronomy. Let's first take a look at Daniel chapter 9, verses 4 to 14. And it says, And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O oh Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings and princes and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law, and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us this great disaster. For under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. So in these verses, we learn that Daniel clearly understood that Israel's exile was because of their sin. 
that they had turned away from the covenant with God and had not remembered to keep his commandments and his statutes. In verse 11 and 13, Daniel refers to the curse and oath written in the law of Moses that had been poured out on Israel because of their sin. This disaster had been warned about in Deuteronomy 4, which foretold that because of their persistent disobedience, they would perish from the land they had been given, and that the Lord would scatter them amongst the people, and that they would be left few in number. Also in Deuteronomy 28, it states that their disobedience would lead to a curse and cause them to be defeated by their enemies, driven to another land, and become a reproach to other nations. So let's go back to Daniel 9 and finish the prayer in verses 15 to 19. And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins. And for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on, his, on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations. And the city which is called by your name, for we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Amen. Amen. So, I'm um, sorry, but that's such a beautiful prayer. <laughs> it um, is. So, composing myself here, <clears throat> with, with great <clears throat> humility, Daniel made His supplication to God. Let me just pause and say why this means so much. As I was um, studying this and reading this this week, you know, I was thinking about us at our church and how relevant this is to us these days. And I was just wondering, you know, do any of us, care that much for our fellow church member? Do we care that much about our corporate church that we would, you know, with this humility and, you know, supplication to God, ask for repentance and forgiveness for our church? Yeah. You know, and it's, we think about it as individuals, right? We think about our own sin, but do we really care that much about our church and the people that God has brought us together with? So that's why it really touched my heart this week. <laughs> so um, I will pass it back to you for five minutes <laughs> since I've just destroyed this. <laughs> uh, they say a personal yeah. testimony is the best way. Yeah. So Barbara, do you have some final thoughts for today? Well, first of all, I know. Lisa. I know. <laughs> and, and quite honestly, we pray for people who are ill all the time and things like that, but we, do we pray for their salvation? Yeah. Do we pray for them to come closer to God and build a relationship? And that's a valid well, point. Well, it's even more than that. From what Alyssa was, ta what Alyssa was talking about, what Daniel's talking about, is the sins of the church. Yeah. is the sins of the global body. And as, as we as church members, we need to be praying for our global church. Yeah. Because it's a struggle not just for us as human beings in ourselves, but we have to look beyond ourselves. 
And, and, and not only that, is that Daniel was praying this prayer because he understood that the time was coming up and the prophecy had been foretold and God could act. But he also knew that God could stay his promise mm -hmm. if he didn't see obedience. Right, it's so all conditional. It's all conditional, and if we look at where we're at at the end of time, you know, God's promises are right before us. We're at the very end of time. And what are we doing to ready ourselves as a church? Because that is our commission. Let's, you know, to go out and prepare a people that are prepared for the Lord to come. Yes. And, to be you able know, to see God face to face. Right. right. And, and, you know, we can, we can, to some extent, delay or hurry his coming by acting as Daniel did. And not only see him face to face, to profess and proclaim his coming to the ends of the earth or Correct. your neighbor next door. Yeah. yeah. So the only, the only thing that I wanted to add as comes from King Solomon, one of the wisest men on earth, and his, his thoughts from Ecclesiastes 1.9. That which has been is what will be. That which was done is that will be, which will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. And we as people need to go beyond this, this, this issue that the, that the Israelites were under was completely turning from away from God, following pagan gods. We need to be repenting. Amen. I... I took a little different approach on this. I thought of more the Jeremiah and they're, they're coming to church and they look good, but, and Ellen White writes in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 55, let those who feel inclined to make a high profession of holiness look into the mirror of God's law. And I want to ask something, what does Deuteronomy mean? We had this in Sabbath school not too long ago. It's the second law or the repeating of the law, right? Mm -hmm. So, to look in the mirror of God's law, as they see its far-reaching claims and understand its work as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, they will not boast of sinlessness if we, says John, not separating himself from his brethren, say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him, that's Jesus, a liar, and his word is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's 1 John 1, 8, and 10, um, 10 and 9. Excuse me. There are those who profess holiness, who declare that they are holy the Lord's, who claim a right to the promises of God while refusing to render obedience to his commandments. These transgressors of the law claim everything that is promised to the children of God, but this is presumption on their part. For John tells us that true love for God will be revealed in obedience to all his commandments. It is not enough to believe the theory or truth of truth to make a profession of faith in Christ, to believe that Jesus is no imposter, and that religion of the Bible is no cunningly devised fable. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, John wrote, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, and that would be all of his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. He that keepeth his commandments dwells in him, or another word would be abides, and he in him. And I've got to actually, even on what you said, what was the new commandment that Jesus gave, besides spread the gospel to the world? The love one another as, as I, I have, have loved, loved you. you. Mm -hmm. And that way the world will know that you are, our or you are my disciples, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How well do we do that? Because that is in the law. 
The law isn't just a set of rules that we follow. The law is either in your heart or it's not. Because it is the very character of God. So, and Barbara, you had it before. What does the Lord require? It starts... Live justly. Right. It starts by keeping His commandments. That's where the foundation begins. Mm -hmm. Confessing our sins, surrendering to His will. And by doing so, we may be righteous and blameless in the eyes of Christ Jesus. So that really would be our petition today. Why, if you haven't, why won't you surrender to God completely? Because you may know what true religion is, or at least we have it in theory, but unless it's in your heart, you can't be the son or daughter of God. And I love what you said, because mm -hmm. we can know it, but do we do it? And really, mm -hmm. even James says, if you don't do it, you're a liar. So today, I pray that we all surrender to God's will and let him dwell in our hearts, that we can do his good pleasure in this world and leave ourselves behind. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord. We are broken. We are in need of mending and repair. Every one of us, Lord, has sinned and will continue to. No one was ever perfect on this earth except for Christ Jesus. And he was perfect to save us from the wages of sin, which are death. If we surrender, if we confess our sin and come to him, Lord, you are so willing, lovingly, to forgive us, to blot it out as if it never happened. What God in this universe has ever been like that? Our prayer, Lord, is that your Holy Spirit may touch each and every person watching this and us, that we may not only have the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, that by beholding you, Lord, we may be transformed and remolded into that character you made us in originally, that we might show your love, Lord, and that people might know that you are a living God because he lives in each one of us, Lord. And so, so much wants to be known in this world and shared with others that we may all have life. We pray this to you, our Father in heaven, to the Son, our Savior and Redeemer, Christ Jesus, and to the Holy Spirit, the one promise, the one who brings all truths to remembrance, that we may have this for us now and always, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.